Welcome to London College of Communications Value Talks, uh, a series dedicated to exploring race, gender, power and education. My name is Luminita Moliko. I'm Graduate Engagement Manager at London College of Communication. And today it's my pleasure to be talking to Jai Bunag, founder of Finifugu Games and LCC graduate. Jai, welcome back to LCC. Oh, and thank you once hi. again for taking the time to share your experiences, knowledge and expertise with our students and graduates. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you a bit about yourself and how your educational experience at LCC was like. Mm. Um, so I'll just introduce myself first. Hi, I'm Simone Jai Bunag. I'm originally from Thailand and I came to LCC after I had finished my undergraduate in architecture and I was looking to completely transition into another uh, into another industry. And um, LCC had a games design, a master's in games design course, and I was amongst the first students there. So I graduated from LCC in about 2015, end of 2015, 2016. Since graduating, I have, um, since graduating, I spent my time pitching and trying to develop projects further uh, with the BBC and in the multiple like games finance uh, meetings and industry meetings in, the, in London. Um, uh, but I eventually met someone who would become my business partner in the year underneath me in, in the MA Games department. Uh, that person is Chris Lee. And now, since then, we've started up a business called Finifugu Games Limited. And we work completely remotely with ab about eight people. And we focus entirely on mobile games, which is what both of us came to the course to do. Um, yeah, and LCC helped to facilitate us meeting with each other, even though we were in different, department, in different years. Yeah. I'm really interested, Jai. This is really interesting. Uh, but I, I'm also going going back a little before the LCC experience. I'm I'm, I'm slightly interested in in your um, your background. So where are you coming from? Uh, what have you done before joining the LCC? And mm. why did you choose the MA Games Design? Um. So I so I have been brought up and I studied at the Rhode Island School of Design covering fine art, design and architecture where the curriculum is extremely broad. Um, so, you know, we would do painting, we would do sculpture, we do ceramics, uh, we know about like installation, graphic design, whatever, and we merge that into this practice of architecture, which is traditional Bauhaus style architecture. Um, and I think that when I had finished my architectural degree, I didn't really feel like there was a place to fit such a generalist skill set. And I saw an opportunity in games. And I think now the landscape's quite different. But um, at that time, a lot of universities were beginning to offer higher education and focusing on like um, games and app design specifically. Um, and since, you know, the UK was closer to home, and I also f saw that resources were a lot less competed, competed for compared to the US, uh, for example, you know, with things like Transfuser or games funding or games competitions or shows and awards, that kind of stuff, there's a lot of it in London and mm -hmm. not a lot of people were really taking full advantage of it. So I felt like there was an opportunity for me to switch over and be able to showcase my work in a way that an older industry like architecture is, uh, just wasn't ready to do because, you know, they usually, you need a lot of experience to be able to show anything for architecture. But since games was so fast moving and so young, I think that that created space for me to to have a platform. And, you know, I, I considered that when I was coming to LCC in London, you know, it's like, it's a smaller town. Mm -hmm. It's not like the whole of America competing for resources. And yeah, and LCC is like right dab in the middle. It's in a really, really nice spot. And the games, um, and the games department was new. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt that with a smaller, more focused, it was it was only a group of four at the time. I felt that with a smaller community, I would get more of an opportunity to really study games and co especially coding because of, in architecture, that's one thing we didn't know. We don't, don't know how to do coding, don't know how to construct uh, for mobile specifically. And because the course was very small, I was able to absorb as much as I could. I had a lot of like teacher to student time. Um, and that was really, really great, really different from my previous education, yeah. And now that you mentioned about your your background and the fact that you met your business partner, uh, business partner, sorry, at the MA Games Design, could you perhaps mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit more the experience that you actually had within the course? What has happened, mm -hmm. um, and where did that uh, take you basically afterwards? 
So um, I, I like backpedal a little bit because the my meeting my business partner, he wasn't the first person that I worked with in the course, right? The MA course was very different from my BA course in the sense where there was a lot of opportunity to work with other people. The, the yeah. assignments are quite open. There's even the collaborative unit. And when I had finished, when I was doing the collaborative unit, I actually created a team, Finifugo and Friends, which is a different squad of people um, between a couple of the different media departments in at LCC. And we made a game called Tascenda, and we got a good amount of like feedback, awards, funding, stuff. Uh, not, not, not funding, awards and recognition for that. We got to travel and really step into the games industry. And um, when that project had reached as far as it was going to go, I started working with other people. I started looking to um, some of my peers, like people in the same year as me. I tried working mm. with some of the BA students. I tried working with some of the MA, the incoming MA students. Because interestingly for LCC, the MA courses are like 1.3 or 5 years long. And because of that, there's like this really nice crossover between the two. So I use that as an opportunity to work with like the new incoming um, students as well uh, when, when I was on my way out. And it wasn't until I think Chris was like the last person that I worked with. So I think they were like, I worked with at least 10 to 15 other students prior to working with Chris. And finally, we, we'd both been doing the same thing. And we've, we've said, yeah, we've worked with everybody else. Let's just try something together finally. So I worked with Chris on his what on the game that would become his final project. And um, yeah, like we really, really hit it off. And I'm glad that the course was flexible enough that it allowed that to happen because that would never have been a possible, I think, in, in some other universities. I think it would be too strict and that wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. And what do you think are the, I don't know, I would say three top uh, strength that LCC uh, helped you with? I don't know, top, let's just say, skills or maybe attitudes so what is it the top three i think that um, i think that one of the good and bad things about lcc which i think for me it's a top thing is that it's quite loose in terms of curriculum and i don't know how this is going to change in the future but i i think it's partially it's the uk system and when you have a more open um, educational system it means that the people in that system need to be much more aggressive and proactive in order to take advantage of things that are available. For example, like the graduate residency program is one of those things where it's actually, it's not just a graduate residency program. There's a lot of different programs that um, UAL and LCC have, but they're not heavily contested at all. Mm -hmm. um, and the school, the professors might not really tell you about them, but if you are proactive and you go and look for them, you can look for support like in funding or with me, like some visa assistance or to get additional mentoring time um yeah and i sorry but um i think my point is that the like the contact time isn't like five days a week it's not like a full-time job and because of that you can really use additional resources of what the school has to offer but also what london has to offer like london has a lot right and i could spend at least like two or three days a week going out to industry mm -hmm. meetings going out to you know preparing stuff for showcases i didn't just have to work on the assignment it wasn't so consuming in that way um, but the bad side about that is that if you're not proactive and you just follow what the curriculum gives you and you don't really take what London has to offer as well, that you might end up with kind of just the bare basics. Um, but actually, there's so much on offer. It's just not, they're just not force feeding you that. And I think that being proactive is like really, really important. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really long answer for like three things. But like, that's. I, no. think, loca I think location, um, it's yeah. not like some of the places outside of London, I think that um, openness, mm -hmm. and I think, and that's partially like how flexible the course is and how you can make your educational experience what you need it to be. And I think that resources and programs um, that are on offer, and this is between LCC and UAL, I think those are my top three things. Um, yeah. Amazing. Sorry. <laughs> um, so now moving, because we talked about a bit your background, then we moved into your LCC experience. Now I'm curious to find out what has happened after you've graduated and if there was something in particular that perhaps LCC helped you with afterwards in your mm. career, in developing or kickstarting your career. So if you could expand yeah. on that, on your life <clears throat> after you've graduated, your professional life. Yeah. So after graduating LCC, um, I spent some time, I think I mentioned at the beginning, but I spent time trying to pitch my projects, much more artistic projects 
in the um, for VC funding and for funding in like you know startup type uh, funding in London, of which there were many opportunities to pitch yeah. and like to practice pitching for that, and to you know going to showcases, going to awards, try and build up enough accolades and prove that I could you know uh, probably finish these projects. But you know that didn't really work out. And then when I had met my business partner Chris, who is slightly more commercially minded. I switched the way that I worked. And then at that point, a lot of those connections that I had made initially came back. And, you know, that's where we found our first part of funding. And that's how, you know, we really got started with what we were doing. And mm -hmm. the publisher, we we ended up, you know, talking to publish publishers from all over, like America, like Asia, wherever. But the publisher that we eventually chose was one in London. And I think one of the big reasons they ended up working with us was because we were in London at the time and we could maintain a very close relationship where we go into the office and we discuss the plans of where the project was going because it was going to be a quite long-term project, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, I really used London as kind of like a bouncing off point to attend conferences in the UK, in Asia, and in America. It's a very nice in-between point uh, between East Coast uh, and Asia as well. And for LCC, um, I actually applied to the graduate residency program towards the end of the amount of time that I was allocated to stay in the UK. I wouldn't have been able to stay any longer. And I was able to get like a one year visa. And it gave me more time in the most important time uh, to develop our project Too Many Cooks, which um, is a two to six person local co-op cooking game, which I didn't explain at the beginning for mobile. Uh, with a London publisher. So it allowed me to maintain a very close relationship with this publisher and continue the project. It allowed me to, you know, we we hired and we worked freelance with a couple of students from the university. I think we, like almost our entire team at the time was like LCC alumni or students. It allowed me to continue going to awards and events. And shortly after we got the funding for Too Many Cooks, we uh, we're able to, you know, start doing our second project, Nude Climbers, with a Canadian publisher uh, who we met at uh, the events around London as well. And yeah, I think that within that one year of time, you know, LCC so helped put... me stay, but mm -hmm. then I also was able to come in and uh, teach. I was able to continue doing lectures, giving critiques, which is something that I've always loved doing and building my portfolio and centering it a bit more around giving back to the um, to the community, the tech community here, especially around LCC. Um, that was something that I wasn't able to really do when I was a student. And it's something that I've been able to do now thanks to uh, the graduate residency program. And now I'm applying for uh, the Exceptional Promise visa mm -hmm. and the graduate residency and the experiences that I've had like working with students and coming in back as a guest lecturer and a guest speaker have really added to that resume. And I think, you know, I'm really thankful that right now because I'm just finishing the application process right now. So, yeah. Sounds amazing. I would like to move now on to. Um, talking about a bit, you know, successes, but also failures, because all too often we hear, you know, the Photoshop version of someone's success, which makes successes feel so less tangible, I guess, for the rest of us. So we think that we, as an, I don't know, when you're working with creatives, failure, uh, failure is part of the creative process. And it's an amazing thing that uh, allows us to grow and to learn, you know. Um, but we're frequently told to fear failure. Well, I think we should really celebrate it because it gets us uh, all where we want to be. So I was just curious if you could perhaps tell us a bit more about, because uh, of course you talked about your career so far and it just mm -hmm. seems very successful, but what are the failures, uh, failures basically that brought you, brought you there or and what, and what have you learned from, from, from them? Mm. Could you, I, could you I think that a bit on that? Yeah, I, I think I'll start with failures, actually. Um, I think, especially as someone who's like brought up as an artist or more of like an artist slash designer rather than like a someone in the commercial space, I think one of the things that I didn't really realize until I had left my undergraduate was how reliant on the space that I was in to create good work, you know? Like when you're surrounded by really talented people and everyone is working their hardest, it's really easy to be a great designer, great artist, and put everything you have into your work. But 
when you get removed from the space that you know you find the most comfortable and for me that was coming to london with no family with no friends in a new industry with a new skill set that i had knew nothing about <clears throat> i found that um i was just not really generating anything and this was something that was very pervasive through my time in my bachelor's degree like every summer holiday every time i came back home i realized that i was not really creative and when i had graduated i was unable to transition i think into into actually practicing my craft because of the fact that um you know i i didn't i wasn't really a proactive player in my in my career right mm -hmm. and for me mm -hmm. like coming to so so that's that that's like a really big failure i think on my end and also during that time you know i would give my portfolio i would ask people for feedback on right. my work and um i think at that time especially you know if you come from a fine arts background there might be this kind of like conflict between like yeah people just don't understand your work or like um it's you versus the world mm -hmm. and not accepting that you have to kind of like adjust yourself or that you can you know you can both improve to match people's requirements but not lose your sense of integrity i think that i didn't really realize that at the time and i just kept thinking that everyone was saying no to me because like they they, they didn't get it or that i wasn't in the right place right um i think that was a big failure and i'd like to segue that into successes because that yeah. was on the that was the first thing on the top that was my first priority when i I realized when I came to London was to kind of be a much pro more proactive member of my um, of my of the direction that my career was taking. And LCC let me do that. LCC was open enough to let me take control of my course, my coursework. Who did I want to work with? What assignments did I want to do? Um, they kind of had things set in stone, but like I was able to change them. Right. I was able to hand things in when I needed to. I was able to go out and compete or go out and showcase or work with people from different departments when I needed to. And I, and I think at that point I started becoming more of an adult, right? Like I, when I started applying to these things, I realized that I could adjust my work and still yeah. maintain artistic integrity. So rather than just remaining as like me as I was, uh, when people said no to me, then I would be like, Okay, uh, what could I do to make you say yes, but also still maintain my integrity? So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure. For me, it's like, you know, it's the whole package deal of London and LCC, where it's open enough that to do both at the same time. I, I don't know if that's very clear. But, no, that answer the, answers the questions quite, uh, quite beautifully. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, so if I had, sorry, could, if I could, had, to sum it up, I would say like my advice to people yeah. from my end, which is a little bit different to students, is that you have to get used to people saying no to you, right? There's a lot of portfolios that you're given, a lot of job applications, and a lot of pitches that I had given in, and people said no. And my issue was that I didn't adapt. Um, and now that I'm a little bit more chill with adapting and I'm not scared to lose my integrity as an artist, it's so much better. Like I can have both. I, I feel like I can do both. I feel like I can keep my keep the direction of art that I want to do and I can get people to say yes to things. And I think that's just like understanding the industry and being able to adapt. Yeah. Really good. Thank you, Jai. Yeah. Um, now I would like to move in our uh, into our final uh, part of our discussions and it's a and, uh, you know, some some reflections. We're taking the time to reflect on 2020, not in just in 2020, but in general. But given the all the whole COVID situation, um, the majority of our speakers, as which are part of the Value Talk series, are people of color who have been affected in a multitude uh, of different ways, like the Black Lives um, uh, movement. So this could be something. Um, um, uh, perhaps you want to explore about representation in your own industries. So I was looking at the at the games industries, um, and uh, this year the Association of the UK Entertainment Interactive Entertainment released the results of its first ever UK 
a games design census surveying uh, around, I think, more than 3,000 games workers. 10% of people working in games are people of color. This is a higher percentage than in a national working population, but much lower than we see in related fields such as, let's say, software development. Uh, people of color are particularly poorly represented in senior positions in games designs. From uh, what you're seeing, my question to you uh, is, in industry, do you feel the situation is improving in games in this mm. respect? Um, I think, uh, just before I dive into that as well, like I think in the census as well, it's really interesting because it's not just people of color who are quite highly represented in the games industry in the census. It's also people who are like non-binary, you know, they don't have traditional, like uh, they don't have a traditional career demographic, like yeah, yeah. career choice, like sexual orientation, like I think even disabilities. Women, uh, women, as, women well. as well. Quite, I think women was the only one which is quite poorly represented in games design. Um, other than that, uh, the other uh, usually, usually minority demographics are quite high in comparison to other industries and um i think that it's only a matter of time until the minorities and like people of color start occupying the more uh what do you call it the more high up positions i think because this i actually do see this um when i go to events uh and industry events around the uk as well like there's a lot of minorities like the minorities kind of start to outweigh uh, outweigh uh, what you could perceive as like the standard majority um, in the UK. And I think it's because it's a young industry. I think that the reason a lot of people are drawn to it is because it's an industry that has affected a lot of people from this generation growing up, you know, games and entertainment, you know, I'm sure that it's drawn in a lot of people. And based on the infrastructure that it has here in the UK, it's very welcoming towards new talent. Right. There's a lot of like yeah. university level um, university or not or um, hobbyist or. Uh, um, like beginner level events and even intermediate yeah. level events that you can get into without having to have like a massive company or not, not having to have like 10 years of experience before you can do this. Right. And I definitely took advantage of that. But mm -hmm. um, I think that's relatively new and that's what's drawn in all the people. And I think that once these minorities uh, have, you know, they've learned and they've studied and they've started practicing in the field. And once they start getting older, I think they will begin to occupy the much higher uh, positions. I think it's just a matter of time. And it just so happens that um, the games industry has like recently brought in a lot more um, attention and workers uh, and, uh, and new people joining the industry. And so we just need to wait for them to really absorb and learn what's there. And then I'm sure they're going to rise up in the ranks because they're all very, very young right now, I think. <laughs> right. OK, really interesting. Um, now I would like to ask perhaps something around the um, uh, design of mobile experiences. And with this pandemic, uh, it's funny because mm. we're uh, less mobile than ever before. Do you think um, as people have become more static and isolated during this um, this uh, COVID period, the way they look at uh, or, or approach their phone is changing? Do you see, um, is actually mobile gaming adapting, you think? Hmm. I really have to, I need to think about this quite a little a little bit because like um, mobile gaming as in like in transportation is like a huge part of like people who use mobile games right like you know people on the tube or people commuting to work those are a huge proponent of people who you know partake in like ca like hyper casual casual games which you just play within between stations right yes. but at the same time yeah. now that everyone is more at home and phones are such an integral part of connecting to other people there, most people's, a lot of people's mobile devices are the most powerful device that they have. It's no longer their laptop. It's no longer their desktop, which might be in the office, right? Um, so this device becomes their primary device for connecting to other people and for entertainment as well. Um, for the games industry during the pandemic, especially for digital games, we've done really, really, really well. Um, especially those multiplayer games, you know, like... Um, among Us or Fall Guys, 
games that allow people to sit together and interact with each other across great distances. I think those have done really well um, during the pandemic. And even though, so it, I, I need to look a little bit more at the statistics, but it's interesting because more people are using digital games as a whole. And I think a lot of people are using mobile games as a whole because the devices are just so powerful that they can offer experiences comparable with like traditional consoles or laptops now. Um, yeah. But it might be offset by the number of people who are no longer traveling and playing games, using them to fill time in between. But what I have seen, though, is that longer, more intense playing experiences uh, where you commit more time to it rather than just a couple of minutes are more popular now, especially those that help us connect with people that we can't be with physically at the moment. And that's really what? cool. I think that's, mm-hmm. that's great that like games have found a way to enter everyday life um, in the same way things like Zoom has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you also mentioned about, uh, of course, you're uh, being based in London now. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, having um, a business partner as well, so I'm not sure where they are based at the moment. You are also mentioning that you're working with the LCC community, alumni community quite a lot, and with yeah. the uh, academics as well. So I'm just curious to see how do you continue to work collaboratively in 2020 with all these communities and with all these people? <laughs> is this is, is it a um, challenge? So I think it is. I, I, I think it's not as much of a challenge for us because of the fact that like when me and Chris started working together, he immediately moved back to Hong Kong. And right. because that happened quite a few months before the pandemic, we had already started creating kind of like an online infrastructure to work remotely, right? So I'm working in London. I connect with the alumni um, friends or collaborators or publishers who, and I attended events here. Um, Chris in Asia, you know, really hand, handles like more of the Asia side. And then the rest of our staff are, some are in Italy, some are in Taiwan, some are in Thailand. And we had already kind of like started setting up an infrastructure um, to handle working long range. We didn't realize that we'd be using it so intensively, <laughs> but I think that it just so happens that we've handled it quite well just because of the unique situation that me and Chris are in where we're always working remotely. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> Not really. So. Yeah, so, so, no, I think it so. You're, you're, yeah. yeah, it hasn't no. affected us that much and I'm very happy that it hasn't. And in fact, I think that, you know, it's brought on, we have a lot of new, uh, new people that we're working with now who I think that we would never have gotten the opportunity to work with if the pandemic wasn't happening. Because now that, um, now that we tell people like, yeah, work is remote, people are much more open to open, being like, oh, yeah. you know, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. Because um, before the pandemic, I think a lot of people who applied to work with us or um, who that we tried to hire sometimes would be like, no, I really want an office. I want an office community. But now everyone's getting more okay with working remotely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although there are a few issues. There's quite a few, um, quite a few of our staff are quite lonely. They don't really leave the house. They say that they don't get up for hours on an end and there's not really a good amount of socializing to be had. So I think there's a bit of a mental strain on some people. So, there's um, so hopefully it doesn't happen. Yeah. So and hopefully how do you it doesn't stretch that? for too much longer. How do you manage that aspect? Uh, how do you deal with this? Uh, Unfortunately, I think for the, for making sure that each person gets enough, like, social experience and mental and like feels mentally relieved the, the mostly rely on everyone else to handle them individually unfortunately there's not we don't really have an office community since we you know we don't ha- we don't have a space to hang out with each other it's very hard to establish that kind of community although we do try to be very flexible with our hours and allow people to you know go and we encourage them to go and meet their friends or spend time with friends and family and ha- you know there's a we work remotely we should take advantage of the fact that we can uh, be a little bit more flexible with our time and that we don't waste time during commutes so i unfortunately like everyone has to manage it individually but hopefully we're giving people enough time and space that they feel that they can do that whenever they want right rather than having to work specifically like a nine to five um hopefully that offsets it but i think there's a limited amount there's a limited capacity we can stretch this for um, before people start feeling way too isolated. Uh, yeah. 
So this brings us to the uh, to the end of this interview, Jai. Thank you so much for for again for taking the time to speak to us. And I hope that the students uh, found a lot of uh, invaluable uh, advices. I think you you just spoke about from from your previous experiences at LCC, how LCC has helped you throughout your careers. You touch base a bit on on successes and failures and your reflection on reflections on 2020 as well. So oh, I wish you the best of luck for, for the future and uh, for everyone else. If you enjoy this talk, then check out the rest of the series where LCC has invited guests to discuss, challenge and develop ideas around today's values. Thank you very much.